All right, here we go. BG Knockout, welcome back. Signing with you, Black. This is our third interview? Yeah, it's the third yep. one. One's by yourself. Yeah. Well, one's <laughs> with your brother, Drayste. Yeah, shout out to Drayste, man. Yep. Probably be here next yep. time on the next run. No doubt. No yeah. doubt. And uh, here you are by yourself again. Yeah. Uh, so let's get into it. Let's get into it. Um, I recently dropped the Mob James interview. Yeah. Uh, which, I'll be honest, I've had more people tell me that's their favorite all-time Vlad TV interview. Than, Seriously? Than really any other interview I've dropped, yeah. Whoa. Well, because I think it was so emotional, you know, he was crying in the middle and, and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, he, you know, I mean, his story is his story and, you know, his brother passing, I'm sure, you know, it was touchy, yeah. Do you know Mob James at all? I've heard of him, I don't know him personally, no. Okay, but you have heard of him? Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. And Mob James is Mob Pyru. Mm -hmm. I got family from his neighborhood, actually. Okay. They're younger. They're from the younger generation, but yeah. Okay. And you're from? I'm from Nutty Block, Compton. Yeah. Nutty Block. Okay. Which is different than, than Southside Crips? Yeah. Yeah. D way different. We're on the west side of Compton. They're on the southeast side of Compton. Yeah. Got it. Got it. But Orlando Anderson was Southside. Yeah. Okay. Was Nutty Block and Southside kind of cool? Yeah, we was clicked up at, at one point. We was Nutty South Atlantic. Nutty Block, Southside, Atlantic Drive. Yeah. Okay. You know, because Crips don't always get along with Crips. No. I mean, during my life, we probably had more beef with Crips than we did with Pyrus, actually. Okay. Yeah. But in terms of Southside, Nutty Block and Southside. Yeah, Southside, they're closer to the Pyrus on their side of town. So it's like you you usually conflict with the people you're closest to. Okay, but you have friends in, in Ma Pyro. Yeah, I mean, like we ain't, we not friends. I wouldn't say friends, but we ain't really had during my lifetime. We ain't had no like ongoing street beef with uh, the mob. Okay, so so Nutty Blockins and and the mob get along more or less. Not get along, but we just we we so far away that it's like we don't we hardly see each other. I, Put it that way. Okay. So I did the interview with Mob James. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this interview kind of spanned uh, a relatively, you know, a number of years. Right. And Mob James originally started running with Suge uh, in, in the, the very early death row days. Yeah, I believe he grew up next door to Suge, um, to where Suge moms, you know, yeah. <clears throat> You know, and, and Mob, Mob was there when Suge punked uh, Vanilla Ice mm. and talked about how they were there when Vanilla Ice signed over, you know, part of his, his publishing or, or whatever else, or okay. Ice Ice Baby, which, which he said was total bullshit. Like, <laughs> you know, it was basically just a shakedown. Yeah, so. yeah. Suge went to him and pretty much punked him out of his shit with chocolate. Yeah. Saying that he wrote the shit the whole nine. Ice Ice Baby. Yeah, didn't have nothing to do with it. So Chocolate had nothing to do with that song? No. He took the contract to Vanilla Ice, made him sign it, and they gave him a check for it. Were you there when that happened? Yeah, I was with you. Okay. And the story that Vanilla Ice said was that Suge took him to the balcony. No, I didn't. I would not nail that. No, no, I don't remember that. You don't part. remember that. But no. he did punk Vanilla Ice. Oh, yeah, he punked him and a lot of people. What, how did he punk him in that situation? Well, basically telling him what he going to do with his arm around him and told him pretty much what you're going to do. You're going to sign this paper and you're going to pay me for this. So we was just getting into it. We didn't have we didn't have no artists, no groups. Chocolate wasn't doing nothing. I mean, just a lot of people sitting around. Okay. You know, people from Texas trying to get into the music thing. And we didn't have nothing. So pretty much everybody, how we was eating was... Fucking people. But but he also said that he was there when Easy E got robbed. We ran into Easy so many times on Melrose, on Sunset. We had one problem with Easy and he got robbed. So I don't know what him and Suge did. It was I wasn't there, but 
we never got nothing from Easy. Okay. So Easy got robbed though. Yeah. You guys robbed him. Yeah. Okay. Well, my own boy Kenny Chubbs robbed him. Okay. Yeah. See, I I don't. I mean, come on, man. Like that don't even sound right to me. But I don't know what he's talking about. I mean, what do you mean, robbed by robbed? Like they put the gun on him and and laid him down. Or did they deceive him in some type of way? Like, what do we mean by robbed? Yeah, we didn't really get into that part of the story. Uh, okay. You saw the interview? Yeah, I saw it. I mean, I saw it, but that's what I was trying to figure out. Like, what do you mean? I don't know. I never heard that before. And, you know, but he did say that they ran into Easy on various, you know, various times and nothing really happened. Exactly. I mean, we've seen them guys a lot and nothing really happened. Just like you said, the incident where I was telling you with my conception and we was at the uh, Universal Amphitheater and it was kind of like a big standoff and Suge had kind of pretty much acted like he was going to see us outside about something. So we went and got strapped up and went outside and we was like, what's up, Suge? He was like, oh, man, I ain't tripping on that. Then they skirted out in the limo. I mean, but we ain't really had no conflict with them like that. Well, we get into sort of a, a later part of the story and you know then it ties into the whole orlando anderson situation okay so originally we talked about a situation where uh suge's suge's friend gets killed mm -hmm. and the the person that you know even though he was never convicted you know multiple people have said that they they think that Wolf did it, who was uh, one of Puffy's, you know, main guys. Mm -hmm. You know, who, who's recently, uh, you know, who's, who got killed some years back. Jake gets killed in Atlanta. Right. You know, that, uh, that's really the first blood on the ground. Right, and that was Suge's close friend. Correct, yeah. So Jake gets killed, and I guess Suge kind of blames Puffy mm -hmm. for it in some regard? Yeah, because the guy who kills Jake is from Puffy's camp. And uh, so, yeah, he holds him responsible for it. So who killed Jake? Uh, the consensus is, it's, it's an unsolved case, um, but the consensus is, and by Georgia PD, Atlanta PD, um, a guy named Wolf, Anthony Jones. Wolf. That was kind of a, you know, he, he was to Puffy Combs what Buntry was to Suge. Which kind of led into the story of, you know, people saying that, that Puffy had put a $10,000 bounty on death row chains. There was bounties on death row chains. Yeah. 10000 I think? $10,000. Right. Your mom had a death row chain. She had a little bitty one. Right. Yeah. Well, they were snatching those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they were snatching those. Okay. And the, the fight in the mall between uh, Trayvon Lane and, and Orlando people were saying was over that $10,000 bounty. Yeah. Did you know anything about this at all? Never. Never heard of it. Never heard of it? Mm -mm. I'd have probably, you know, been looking for a death row chain. <laughs> I mean, if I'd have heard of it, I'd have probably been trying to get that 10000 me and all my homies, I'm sure. So I ain't never heard this before. Did Orlando ever talk to you about that situation in the mall with Trayvon? No. Okay. Stuff like that happens so often. I mean, it wouldn't be nothing to talk about like like it would be a big deal, you know? Like in the 90s, it was always, if you go to the mall, there's no telling what might happen in those days. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, you've had situations in that mall? All the time, man. Like, we didn't have fights in malls, shootouts, gang fights, melees, name it. You've had actual shootouts in the mall. Yes. So that, that's just a death mall, basically. I mean, not that particular mall, but it's just, you know, in the 90s, gangbanging was at a such high, you know, it was like so heightened at that point to where, you know, like people would represent their, their neighborhoods with their sweatshirts and stuff like that. We would have our gangs, you know, going across our shirts and the colors, you know what I mean? So... And we would usually go to the mall in packs, you know what I'm saying? At least in a small group. And, you know, if you run into your, you know, your enemy there, it's like, come on, what do you think is going to happen? 
So it was just on site? Yeah, pretty much, yeah. Okay. So you would walk around everywhere with a gun on you, no matter where? You would have to, yeah. I mean, yeah. It would be smart to do. Like, we have a saying in L.A., we would say, uh, better, better to be caught with it than without it. You know what I mean? Were there certain places where you would not carry a gun? Nah, nah, at that point, in the 90s, there was no, there, like for me and for certain people that I knew, there was not, it was not an option not to, you know what I mean? It was like, what was the commercial, never leave home without it? <laughs> it was like one of them situations, yeah. So you would go to the grocery store, you Everywhere, have a church. My mother would pull up on me in my hood to take me to church, and I got it on me. And I'm not going to say, Mom, I got a gun, because I couldn't tell her back then. So I would just have to be in a church with a gun through the whole service, just looking stupid. <laughs> Feeling guilty, too, at the same time. All right. I mean, but you hear you hear some real crazy situations where, like, shootouts happen at, like, funerals and wakes and, and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah, I mean, I know a situation where a guy, he was from a rival neighborhood of somebody that I think he got along with. And um, <clears throat> it was just a bad situation how the person passed. He was at the funeral and got killed by some of the people, you know, that was on the side of the purse of the deceased, you know. And he died at the funeral in a, in, a, in a conflict that arose, you know, just the emotional part of it. People getting in their feelings and the story, you know, it's like the guy is dead and, you know, people want some type of resolve or get back. And, you know, it kind of got out of control and he got killed at the funeral. And this was last year. So the guy that got killed, was he the guy that killed the person at the no, funeral? It was probably some of his homies or something or somebody he knew or he was close to. It was something like that. So he was trying to come and show that, you know, it was personal or whatever. But, you know, at that time, it's not it's just not smart, you know, to, to even go around. You know what I mean? If you didn't have nothing to do with it, it's probably not smart to even go around until all that stuff dies down. But he died at the funeral. Yeah. Wow. So he shows up at a funeral to try to pacify things, ends up dying in the mm -hmm. process. So even funerals are not safe. Nah. Because that stuff is so ingrained in people. You know, it's like even me, like I'm, I, I remove myself from being around, you know, that element, you know, the thinking, you know, the energy, you know, being in the hood, in the city, all this stuff. Because when you're around it, it's going to bleed into you. You know what I mean? And um, you just have to stay away, man, especially if you're trying to evolve from that. It's, it's pretty, it's best to stay away. What about kids? So let's just say you see one of your enemies mm -hmm. and they had their little daughter with them. Back then, <clears throat> it would probably be, it depends on the person. You know what I mean? It depends on the person. It depends on if the enemies came through and shot and hit a kid. You know, if they came through shooting all crazy, hit a kid, you probably wouldn't care. Then it would be him and his kid. You know what I mean? So it just depends on it depends on the individual, I suppose. Well, the fact that they hit a kid has nothing to do with their kid. It doesn't matter, yo. Like that's that ain't the thinking. You know what I mean? It's like it's it's like if somebody rolled up on you in a certain neighborhood, and you might be like, I'm not from here. That probably wouldn't fly. You know what I mean? You you wouldn't probably be able to talk yourself out of it. Just depending on how they feel. It, it depends on, especially if they just recently lost somebody. They probably wouldn't even ask you anything. You know what I mean? Right. And you hear of kids getting shot in drive-bys, mm -hmm. you know, stray, stray bullets. Usually not such. intentionally. Usually. Because a lot of gang members, they don't, they don't go to the gun range. You know what I mean? And then a lot of times they send kids to do the job. They send kids to shoot, man. I mean, come on. What were the youngest shooters that you've seen? Maybe 13, maybe. Mm. Yeah. Too young. Too young to, you know what I mean? Never shot a gun before. Ain't got no type of practice. So the aim is not going to be what it's supposed to be. I mean, I'm not going to ask about the specific situation, but can you say how old you were when you first shot at somebody? Mm. I really can't say, man. I mean, I was out there young, bro, like 10 years old. You were shooting at people at 10 years old? Probably, yeah. What was going through your mind as a 10-year-old with, with this Just gun? Just trying to please my big homies. Hmm. Just trying to, you know, impress people. 
impressionable at 10, man. I'm super impressionable, you know? Yeah. I mean, do you feel like the big homies were taking advantage of you in retrospect? Probably. I mean, it depends on their thinking. Like, maybe they thought that they were trying to put something in me that I needed, you know what I'm saying, to carry me on into my manhood. Like, because it's like this, like, what it came to be, game banging, it was not always called that. But it started off as something positive, right? <clears throat> and And then it got derailed into some negative stuff. So by the time I came on the scene, it was all about being tough. And they were trying to teach us to be savage because you got to be a savage to be in the street. You know what I mean? Because people will take advantage of you and they will use you. You know, they'll send you out there to, you know, get hit or get all the time. You know what I mean? Like use you as a little torpedo, as they say. And I think maybe at that time they were just teaching me what they thought I needed in order to survive and thrive in the hood. You know what I mean? Because I've seen the people that did try to take advantage and it was usually stuff with like drugs or snatching purses or robbery. You know, it was like the old guys that set a robbery up, send the young guys in and then take most of the money. You know what I mean? Stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, because cause my friend, my son, you know, who's who's from New York, mm -hmm. uh, you know, he did seven years in prison. Right. And when I asked him how come he never joined a gang, because he's real close with Bloods and Crips and everything else like that, he just told me straight up, he said, the, the problem with these gangs, especially in the prison environment, is that, you know, you end up joining because let's say you're scared and, you know, you're getting, you know, pushed, you know, pushed up on or whatever else. You join this gang and the first thing they have you do is go on these missions that they don't want to do themselves. And next thing, and before you know it, you've racked up a whole bunch of new charges and you're in there forever. I wonder so he, if he was thinking like that back when he was younger, though. You know what I mean? Because I doubt if he rationalized that far. Well, no, he, he was a little bit older at this point. Yeah, he yeah. Ex so, exposed. He was, you know, he had a, he had a you know, well, the, he the, had a song. And, and, usually you know, he had a deal a and gang, so forth. When you join a gang, they make you do stuff just to... You know, so to see if you really with it, you know what I mean? Like in our case in Compton, you know what I'm saying? Like in my neighborhood, it's not, it's like, we got to see if you really with this lifestyle. You can't just be, you know, around here acting like, you know, we call it claiming the fame. You know what I mean? When you just running with a pile of dudes and you ain't never proved yourself. You know what I mean? So you have to prove yourself to us. Like usually it's not like that we wouldn't do it. We'll probably have to take you to show you what to do. You see what I'm saying? I mean, he's talking about an older situation, not, you know what I'm saying, once you're already in prison. Yeah, that's different. 20s or whatever. Yeah, that's sad. That's if, you join, if you join after that, that's, we won't even respect you, honestly. If you wait that long, like, we ain't going to respect you. What's, in, your, in your point of view, what's the age limit of joining a gang for the first time? Usually it's when you're young, bro. It's like teen. It's a teenage mentality. You know what I'm saying? So if you join the gang after you're a teen, that's kind of su it's suspect to us. You know what I mean? So so 20 years old is way it's kind of yeah. It's like come on, man. You waited till you was 20 to be from a gang. You know what I mean? That's kind of. I mean, right now I wouldn't advise anyone at no age to get in a gang in this day and time. Never. I would discourage it. You know, to the utmost. But back then, you know, yeah, you would. You know, it's something you grow into. As a kid, you got to get into some fights. You got to get into the feeling of what it feels like. You know what I mean? Go to school with the homies and do dumb shit. You know what I mean? So you understand it a little more. And then if you just get into it when it's, I don't know, it's kind of strange to me. So when you look at like a, a Lil Wayne or a Chris Brown who starts claiming. Those you know, guys what? are so crazy to me, man. Like no disrespect to them. Cause I really admire them kids, man. But uh, I think it's sad that, you know, God blessed them to get as far as they did to want to entangle themselves in this type of, you know, environment. Like that's, that's backwards if you ask me. Yeah. I mean, I've always, I always thought it was strange. I've yeah, talked about crazy. it You're with like... actual OGs like Trey D and, and, you know, I think Trey D when I interviewed him, he said, I feel it has to either be a psychological defect to where you don't want to enjoy your life and enjoy your wealth and, you know, uh, ride around on boats and, you know, pop bottles and just, just you know, live a, a, a stress-free, you know, uh, uh, life uh, as far as 
attracting unwanted attention and aggression upon yourself. Why would you want to be rich and start fighting people? I mean, that's, it makes no sense to me. So, you know, I, I see it as like the peer pressure aspect is that, you know, is this what you really want for yourself or do you feel that this is the only way you'll be secure in certain areas? It's just a sense of wanting to belong to something, but in my opinion, I think the older guys, whoever they were, that they ended up, you know, gravitating towards to eat, end up even getting in that crowd, should have kept them dudes, you know what I'm saying? Like, should have told them dudes, look, man, it's cool for y'all to kick it like this and like that, but don't be representing that, man, because y'all got something good going on. And that it only brings a negative vibe, bro. Like, ain't nothing positive can come of that. Nothing. Yeah, I mean, because you know, I'm friends with you. I'm friends with Trey D. Uh, I have gang homies. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and you could ask any of them. I have never even remotely had any interest in being part of this. Yeah, man. Ever. You all the conversations you, you, we've had on the phone, have I ever asked you to at all entangle myself in this? Yeah, man, it's like, yo, come on, Vlad, you, you got more sense than that, man. It's like, now that I can see from two different spectrums, you know, there was one point in my life where I only can see from a gang point of view because I was so, in, you know, enthralled in it. You know what I'm saying? Like, and now that I can see both sides, I would never advise anybody. You know, it's one thing to be cool with people. It's another thing to get involved with their politics. And usually gang politics are, it's like a trap, man. The entire thing is like a trap. You know what I'm saying? To be honest with you. It's illogical. Yeah. Most of it is illogical, honestly. So let's get back to Orlando for a second. So the one thing that's been consistent, you know, when speaking to Mob James or, or other people, was that everyone pretty much agrees that my, that uh, Orlando was a hitter, that this guy was you know was thorough, yeah, was, was a was a real was a real you gangster. You come from like when you see we 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 come from, our generation is called the baby gangster generation in Compton. That's why my name is BG Knockout, right? So you had to be thorough to be from our generation, bro. You couldn't anybody that wasn't pretty much got you know, got squeezed out the way. You know what I mean? So you had to be, yeah. And you said Orlando was your best friend. Yeah, he was definitely one of them, yeah. Okay. Uh, Mob James says something very interesting. Mm -hmm. He said that Tupac should have been escorted out the door, into the car, and driving away when they was whooping his ass. Now, Orlando probably could have understood, would have accepted that ass whooping because he know I got some bona fide ass niggas whooping on my ass here. Right. I can catch him in Compton. Now, Tupac take off him. This nigga ain't nothing but a rapper. This is how he looking at him. He ain't looking at him like no, no gangbanger. So I got to get this fool. I go back home and they say, Tupac beat me up. I can't show my face in the hood no more. That's him romanticizing because to me, what's worse is the dudes who kicked him with this, with the long, you know, the long front toe shoes on, trying to kick him in the ribs and in the face. Now I'm sure his punch wasn't, you know, as hard as those shoes were. You feel what I'm saying about them big old 300 pound guys? You feel me? So I think that would be. I think he romanticized it, saying it like that, honestly. Well, yeah. I mean, he also said that that Suge should have seen this whole situation coming. Suge knew it was consequences from the beginning. Yeah. Suge knew it was consequences when they put the $10,000 on the chain. You know, a lot of people sitting here and, and if, it wouldn't, if it wouldn't for Suge, none of this would have ever, ever happened. He should have, Suge should have, listen, as rich as Suge was in the position he had, he should have did everything he could to defuse that situation, bro. You know what I mean? Because that was a silly thing to do. Because even still, if you can remove yourself and, and if you can remove Pac from the situation, all the people you say you care about is still going to be involved. Because they can't run to the hills with you, bro. You know what I'm saying? They can't go to Encino and all these places. You feel me? So come on. And why do you want that type of energy around when you got that type of money and power, man? It's kind of... It was backwards, yo, in my opinion. 
Well, I interviewed Greg Kading, who mm-hmm. was one of the lead investigators. You know, they came on afterwards to investigate that whole shooting situation. And, and he said flat out. It had Suge and other members of um, his entourage, you know, if they'd all been forthright and uh, not wanted to take the matter into their own hands and handle it on the streets, uh, yeah, absolutely, Tupac's case should have and could have been resolved really quick. Everybody knew it was Orlando. It was just getting the evidence to support that knowledge. And, and Keefe D, in, in, you know, in his, uh, his statements uh, to Greg, said that him and Suge made eye contact, mm-hmm. and they, they grew up together. They knew exactly who the other person was. Mm-hmm. So, you know, Keefe said Suge, Suge could have identified him, but Suge said absolutely nothing. Yeah. And, you know, in 2019, this case is still unsolved. Do you understand that mentality? You can't say nothing, bro. You just can't. Not if you're from a gang. As bad as you may want, you can't. If you're a part of the mob, you can't talk. You know what I'm saying? If you're a part of a gang, you can't talk. That's the, you know, it's a code of silence. You can't say, you can't say nothing. So, if your brother, Drayster, mm-hmm. was sitting in the car with you, and some guys that you knew mm-hmm. rolled up, opened fire, and killed your brother right there in front of you. Mm-hmm. And the police said, who did it? You would say, I have no idea. I have no idea. If your mother was sitting in the car seat next to you. Mm-hmm. I have no idea, they, Vlad. Can't say nothing. Your own mother. Can't. You have kids? Yep. If your kids can't say nothing. Sit, doesn't matter who it is. What do you want me to say? I mean, I guess that's is what it is at this point. I mean, I mean, it is what it is. Like if if I signed up to something, bro, like it, it's that. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. What if a, a random rapper rolled up mm-hmm. and, and ended up, you know, not nothing gang related. You know, someone you're you're beefing with on the internet over over some bullshit, mm-hmm. just some dumb shit, which you know all of us have done at some point. Mm-hmm. And this dude rolled up on you and opened fire, and your mother and kids all got killed. Can't say nothing. Can't say nothing. So you would not snitch on your worst enemy. No, I can't. No, I wouldn't. See, there's a thing. Let me just tell you this. Now, <clears throat> this is something I tried to talk to my homies about, if they remember, right? But, like, certain gangs or certain races and groups have certain policies. You ever heard the book called The Art of War? Yeah, Sun Tzu. Okay, so this is one of the books that, you know, prison gangs and groups read in jail. They study this book and they, they, they live by it. Now, the whites in prison and the Mexicans, for the most part, have a policy that they can tell on anybody that's not a part of their group. Hmm. It comes from the art of war. It's pretty much, you know, getting rid of your enemy by any means. And the, the greatest war fought is when it... I mean, the greatest war one is one that you don't have to fight necessarily, right? So um, they have this thing, yo. And and one thing that I do know is that if you at war, at odds with somebody or with an enemy, and you don't fight the war the same way, you're probably you're probably not gonna win. If you're not willing to go to the same extreme, you're probably not gonna win. You know, so. I presented this idea to my homeboys, you know what I mean? And they just so, they so stuck on the old days, like, you know what I mean? Like the old ways that hasn't gotten us anywhere, to be honest. And, you know, I was in the county jail, we was in the gang module in 98, and some of my homeboys, you know, in Compton, they was beefing with the Mexican gangs in the city. And some of them was actually coming to court, bro, like, Gang are tired up, telling from, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like seriously, man. Like, no disrespect to the essays, man. To the Southsiders or nothing, but they were, bro. And it was, you know, I had to see it in court. I was in court chain. They take everybody chained up together. You know what I'm saying? Into the if y'all got the same courtroom, it don't matter. It's the same judge. It, y'all don't gotta have the same uh, lawyers or anything. Your case is going. Everybody case is gonna get, you know, tried back to back to back to back. And I saw that, and I was—I just was like, "Yo, that's wild." 
So what you're saying is that the, the Mexican mafia or the Aryan nation, they will I mean, whoever they, will... they are, I just know that they do that. I know that they okay. do that. Wherever the orders come from, maybe. Maybe it come from higher up, but I know they, they, they can do that. And I know the blacks okay. ain't willing to do the same thing. So you guys are basically at a disadvantage when it comes to super, this gang shit. Super disadvantage, yeah. In more ways than one, and that's just one that's just one instant, but definitely, yeah. Well, what are some of the other ways? In prison, the blacks are still sectioned off by city instead of being all together. And the Mexicans are not, the whites are not, the Asians are not, but the blacks are. It's the Bloods, the Crips, the Compton, the Watts, the South Central, the this, the that, the Bay Area, different parts of the Bay Area, you know what I mean? Like, it's crazy instead of being all just one thing. So that's another right. disadvantage. But they'll come together in the instance of a riot, but that's it. You know what I mean? Like, which is it's just sad. Right, because Freeway Ricky, you know, in our last interview told me something interesting. He said that... You can't sleep in a cell with a black guy. Really? No, it's against the law. A Mexican gang member cannot have a black celly. No. He has to go to the hole. So he has to basically fight that guy if, or, or, or something of if, that. If, if the numbers are, are level or it's going to be a war, then he has to go to the hole until a, a, a Hispanic cell open up. Unless he's a, unless he's a South Sider, yeah. Because they have black South Siders. Mm. Okay. But yeah. outside of those, very few people. Outside of those, it's not happening. The, Nor the North Angels, the Northern Mexicans, they have black North Angels too. So they can sell with their own also. But that's the only instance. Yeah. Right. So basically he said that, yeah, they have to go into the hole. Yeah. And, and, and just wait for a cell to open Absolutely. up. Absolutely. Same with us. We would have to do the same thing. A mm. black would have to do the same thing. Yeah. I mean, uh, China Mac was here recently. He spent a lot of time in prison. And mm -hmm. he said that... Uh, There's majority Puerto Ricans and Dominicans. Uh, so Latin kings and so forth. Yeah. Um, Latin kings, uh, patriots, and things like that. But um, it's different. The culture is different. East Coast, West Coast. You know, West Coast, I've been the. I mean, you're out there, so you know, it's more segregated, right? Everybody, mm -hmm. you know, black people here, even in the, in the street, like, in, you know, even black people here, Spanish people, like, Mexicans here, Asians here, and there's not really a lot of mingling going on. And when you come to New York, it's different. You know what I'm saying? It's like everybody's like this. So it's, um, it's a different culture over here. Um, in, in the prisons in New York, you know, you have your, 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 your Spanish gangs, you have your black gangs, but it's not like, you know, it's not like, like that. Like, they can't mingle with each other. Like, you can't bunk with a Spanish person. It's not like that. If you're not linked with nobody, then, yeah, you're just going to be looking stupid. Right. Once again, another disadvantage. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I mean. See, it was, it was different before because... The BGF, the Black Gorilla family, you know, they had a they had a stronghold on prison at, you know, probably in the you know the 60s, the 70s, and stuff like that, and probably before that. So it was different at that time. You know what I mean? They probably you probably didn't have a choice. You know what I mean? Because from what I heard, they was, you know, if you didn't fall in line, they they'll do something to you. You know. But that all broke up over time. You know, with infiltration, and people debriefing and stuff like that. So. Yeah, I mean, you don't hear very much about BGF these days, period. They still they still act like they're in prison, like, on the main line. And you can't be in prison on the main line from a prison gang, yo, unless you debriefed. So, mm -hmm. like, the people that be acting like they're a part of that stuff in jail, they just, they laughable. Because I know you're not just walking around like that. Well, well let's get back to the Orlando story for a second. So, the shooting happened mm -hmm. in, in Las Vegas. Uh, Tupac dies. And, you know, that was your friend, and I understand that you're not going to comment about his his involvement in it, mm -hmm. you know, firsthand. But I interviewed Greg Kading, and he told me some interesting things that I, I didn't know before. Any of the Southside Crips that were actually working as informants, were any of them wearing wires or anything of that sort? No. 
No. They were coming after the fact, saying, hey, I was here, I was listening to the conversation that was going on, and this is what was said. And did they have cases themselves that they were trying to lessen by giving this information up? Not at that time, no. So why were they cooperating with the police? Uh, different, sometimes they would have a relationship based on some prior incident with the police. Um, you know, everybody has their own motive. It's not always because you're trying to get yourself out of trouble. Sometimes it's because you're getting paid. Oh, so they were being paid by the police. There are informants that do get paid. I had informants all over the place. And sometimes, you know, you get together and you meet them at the Starbucks. They give you some information. You give them, you know, a hundred bucks and you go about your business. And what they're thinking, you know, this is an important component of this, yeah. is what they're thinking is that, you know, I'm paying this forward because when the time comes where I do get pickled up and I'm in trouble, I've already done these guys favors and they're gonna return the favor. Wow. Uh, what's your take on that? I don't, I ain't never heard of it, but you know, I know when I went to prison in 98, right? When I was fighting my case, actually, I didn't even go to prison yet and I wasn't even convicted yet. Um, one of the houses that we had in my neighborhood, you know, I had a private investigator on my case too. So he was getting stuff. And, um, one of the houses in my neighborhood, it was informant calls coming out of, yo. Like from, from, from one of the, you know, headquarter houses in the neighborhood. But, you mm -hmm. know, I couldn't see the name and I did warn my homies about it, like to try to weed that out. You know what I'm saying? So it's definitely possible. Have you ever seen, uh, you know, snitches in the neighborhood get killed? Not personally, but just heard stories of that? I mean, I've, I've heard stories, yeah. Yeah. You know? I've heard stories with people that they just said, it, you know what I'm saying, and got killed. You know what I mean? Like, without even any proof. It's just the, the type of person that told them, you know, the, the statue, you know what I'm saying? Like, the, the weight that he holds in the hood was enough. You know what I mean? So yeah, I've seen I've seen several different things like that. Yeah. You know, I forgot who told me, but you know, I heard stories of people getting killed on their way to court. Mm-hmm. In court? <clears throat> yeah. All type of things. Mm -hmm. In court? You've heard of people getting killed in court. Yeah. Stabbed or, you know, almost, you know, people try to kill them in court, yeah. Yeah. Well, here's another interesting part about the Orlando story. Uh, according to Greg Kading, they they started getting what initially was anonymous calls. Mm. In addition to a family member of Orlando Anderson's own family who early on was contacting detectives and saying, my nephew was likely involved in this. My nephew? Yeah. But you're not talking about Keefe D? No, he's a, he's a female. So Orlando Anderson's aunt was reporting to the police that her nephew killed Tupac? There was definitely somebody in that immediate family environment that was, I don't want to create continued issues for, you know what, uh, what takes place um, in these, everyone's going to go and try to figure out who this is. And right. then of course, you know, there's a responsibility on my part not to create harm for people and but yeah, this is, this is the way it played out. There was a okay. family member, a female, who was calling the police, ratting out Orlando Anderson. Was, was that female under investigation for other stuff? Absolutely not, no. She was just volunteering this information because she initially was angry she, at, at, at no, Orlando? Initially, she was volunteering the uh, information completely anonymously, under an alias, Candy. See, that's dangerous, bro, because look, this is how you can view that, too, in another way. Just say... Just say should paid a bunch of people to just call anonymously, right? And then just say whoever didn't like him. You feel me? Saw the opportunity to finally shit on him. You know what I'm saying? So it's just an ugly situation, man. Because if you if you if you if the police is in one instance and say he was thorough, he was in the street moving like this, there's naturally gonna be some people who don't like him. You understand what I'm saying? So it could be an instant like that. And then his aunt, I mean, maybe, maybe did she smoke crack? Was she one of the, the people on crack or was she a drug addict? I asked him whether she was a criminal herself or, you know, fighting a case or whatever else. And he mm -hmm. said, no, he said that she just got tired of it. 
you know, she just got tired of all the murders and, and everything else like that and just wanted, you know. See, I'm not really close to Orlando's family, yo. I just knew a couple, like, I knew him and the two of his uncles. You know what I'm saying? I didn't really, I seen his grandma, his mom. They've seen me on occasion throughout the year, but not in a, in a way that they'll know who I am if they see me like that. Because me and Orlando, we was in the street, bro. Like, we wasn't usually at my house or his house. We was out in the world doing what we did. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, uh, I don't know who this aunt could be, but that's interesting. Keefe D does his confession. And uh, what I found interesting also in this Greg Kading interview that I recently did was that... Did he assume that this would be like sealed up and never see the light of day? Absolutely. I believe that was his mindset is that uh, it would never come out. Okay. Yeah. But it comes out. And I doubt that he even knew that it was recorded. You know, he probably was unaware of the fact that it was being recorded. Oh, so there wasn't a tape recorder right there when... No. Oh, it was like a hidden recorder? Yeah. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. So he was being secretly recorded by, by the police while, while giving his confession? Yeah. Okay, and that's legal? Oh, absolutely. All day long. <laughs> All day long. <laughs> yeah, when you go into a police interview room, you better expect that there's a recording going on. And you're not going to see the recorder, but it's... Oh, you know, wow. Oh, that's yeah. how it's done these days. Watch I, any crime documentary, and you're sitting there watching videotape of a guy being interviewed, and a, that guy doesn't necessarily know that there's a videotape on. Okay. Was he videotaped or just audio recorded? Uh, just audio recorded. Yeah, because we did the, it wasn't at the police station. We actually did the interviews at his lawyer's office. And you guys just had tape recorders on you? I mean, recording yeah, on little, you? Little, yeah, small little concealable recorders. So yeah. that whole confession was, I guess, secretly recorded, but this is completely legal in the police world. Whoa. Whoa. Yeah. See, that's why it's better to remain silent, right? <laughs> right, because anything you say can and will exactly will be used against that's, you. That's the key word. Mm -hmm. Right. And, you know, something I, I realized this the other day, you know, because I'm, you know, I haven't dealt with very much, you know, criminal activity myself. But I, I was looking at a, uh, you know, at a court document the other day. And it said the United States of America versus that person's name. Right. And, and, and it just kind of just hit me for the first time and like. You're fighting against the whole country, exactly. essentially, and and with an unlimited amount of resources. Do you know why that is? Why is that? Because usually when you break the law, um, you're considered like an enemy of the state. Mm. That's kind of, you know, like, that's what I realized when they used to make us pledge allegiance when we were little. We didn't even know what allegiance meant. We didn't even know what pledging meant. You understand what I'm saying? And so they pretty much, pretty much made us pledge with our right hands to say that we would not go against anything, you know, American pretty much, you know, the laws included, right? So I think that's the reason without them telling you that, because how can you go against the whole United States corporation? How? Oh, yeah, because I remember there is a, there's a case now of a woman who left America to join ISIS, Whoa. you know, and things didn't work out, and now she wants to come back to America, and America's like, nah. Of course. Nah, you can't, you can't come back. You're, you're, you're no longer a citizen. Like, you know, you know, we may not be trying to get you and, you know, whatever, you know, prosecute you or kill you, but you cannot come back here. Go ahead and yeah, stay in Syria. Worth you it. are not part of America anymore. <laughs> hope it was worth it. <laughs> she crazy for that. She crazy. Yeah, she blew that. Well, good luck to her. Yeah. Yep. Um, what was interesting also was, uh, you know, after the Keefe, you know, well, from the Keefe confession, uh, at, at the time that he did his confession, everybody in the car was dead except for the driver, who was uh, Terrence Brown. Mm -hmm. And in 2015, Terrence Brown was killed inside of a weed dispensary called Chief Keefe's Glow Shop. 2000 what? 15. Mm. I think I heard of that. It was in Compton? Uh, where the hell was this thing? Yep, it was in Compton. Yep, Compton. Yeah, it was mm -hmm. in Compton. Yep. Hmm. Yeah, not to say it was related okay. at all to that, 
but yeah. The... No, it wasn't. It wasn't. It was some robbery stuff, but yeah. That's crazy. So you heard about that situation? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, 2019, it's still unsolved. Um, you know, and we'll see if it ever gets solved. Uh, you know, Keefe D said what he said. That should and be enough. That I mean, that should have been there. enough. If, I mean, if they, I don't know, man, that's weird. I mean, sheesh, what more do they want? What more do they want if this dude didn't said all this stuff? He was in the car, like, come on, bro. Like, what more are y'all asking for? I don't understand. Yep. Well, I mean, uh, Greg Kane thinks that... Because I don't have any real confidence in the fact that anything will be done, you know, I always try to leave it with the fact that uh, you don't have to always rely on the court systems to give you closure. Or, yeah. Or, you know, you can look at the information available, draw conclusions, and then realize that, uh, you know, you can be very confident as to what happened. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you might as well. I mean, come on, man. It's too long, bro. And, yeah. you know, it's still it's, it's still a sad situation. It's still touching. Um, you know, people are very much close to both sides. They should, man. Why not? Well, you know, at the end of the Mob James interview, uh, he said that he has a daughter that actually bangs uh, Southside Crip. Whoa. My daughter is, is me and her mother. Yeah. My daughter is a little rougher than my son's <laughs> and is I, I'm trying my best with her. And I have her son right now, um, my grandson, and I'm helping her with my grandson. But she coming along, but she's, she's my payback. Oh, That's so my, she's actually somewhat involved in- She's a South Side, she's from South Side. Oh, she's from- Yeah. Your, your enemy's yeah. side, essentially. Yeah, exactly. Oh man, I mean, it depends. I mean, if he's taking it that much to heart, maybe, yeah. But he should be over that, man. He he not over that yet. He still he well, he loved the mob that much. <laughs> well, well, he said he's no longer part of Mob Pyro. He talked a lot, so I'm sure he probably ain't. Yeah, I I don't know about that. I mean, he you said know. it on tape, bro. I mean, what do you mean? I seen him saying a whole lot. I mean, he talking about he talking about his homie robbed easy. That's telling. Um. He said his name, so I mean, he probably told a whole lot of stuff. So yeah. Well, he he named the guy that killed his brother. This guy okay, George. That's telling. Uh, though. That's still AKA, telling. Aka Aka Monkey. According Man. to gang code, that's snitching. Well, he said he's no longer part of it. For this to be my life, and then at the end of the day, my friends killed my brother. Man, that killed me. So there's no way in the world I can I can be a part of this, and 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 still feel good about it. And that's why I don't understand why my nephews and my other brother still want to be a part of this. Yeah. Ain't, ain't that much street out here. Right. And this is why at the beginning of the interview when I said you're a mob pyro, you said used to be. Yeah. So you, you yeah. don't claim it anymore. No, I don't. Man, you better sock me upside my head if I ever say <laughs> that again in my life. He didn't leave willingly. He left according to the pressure. <clears throat> I'm not sure. You'll have yeah, to ask him. that's what it sounds like. I mean, it's... You gotta figure that out. It's not hard to figure out, but it's cool. More power to him, man. I hope he get it together and live his life. You know. Yeah. Well, you know, he lost his brother, and uh, I think that was pretty much it for him. After after Buntry got killed, and he kind of described the environment. He said that like eleven of the Bloods at death row ended up killing each other. Alton wasn't the first that was killed under Suge Night Watch, and this is where everybody. It's old Buntry, it's just Buntry dead. You got Vincent, you got Heron, you got um, Hen Dog, you got Chin. You, I mean, I can just name them. This was 10 or 11 people? Yeah, you got all of these guys up under. T the 10 same. or 11 Pyrus. Pyrus. Were killed under associ death row associating watch. with death row. Yeah. Yep, I've, I've heard a lot about it. Mm hmm. Yep. Was was Suge sentenced? You know, did Suge take the twenty eight year plea deal last time we talked or no? I thought he did. I mean, that was the word, but I'm not sure. Oh, hold on, well, let me look this up. How many years he got in now? I think he's got a couple years in. You know, time served, and then he got twenty eight total. And uh, being that it's state time, he might get half of that. Mm -hmm. 
So he might be out maybe 12 years or so. Dang, he keep getting lucky, boy. He should move out the country. If I, if I was shook, I'd go straight. <laughs> i go to Ghana somewhere. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we actually, yeah, this was back in November. We actually talked about it. Okay. So, so yeah, you you were here when, uh, when you know, you and Dresa were here when we talked about Shug's deal. Um, yeah, man, quite a, quite an ending to the death row story. So sad, bro. I heard they supposed to do that story, huh? Are they supposed to do Shug's life or what? Something I don't think I anyone really. I don't table. think anyone really wants to work with Shug. Is the problem? Yeah, I mean, they probably will do it without what I'm him. You know what I'm saying? They'll, you know how they'll do it. They'll, they'll make it up if they have to. They got enough to work with to make a good story. <laughs> you know what I mean? They do. Yeah, I mean, there's so many angles to the whole death row story exactly. that it's just like, I mean, it's it's pretty amazing. Like, it's it's really you you could make a story out of just one year out of death row. Exactly. And and, and it'll it'll be like just a, a mind blowing, you know, set of events. Well, yeah, man, listen, shout out to Shug. People think I have some sort of grudge against him or he, he did something to me one day and I'm, you know, lashing back. That That's not, the, you know, it's not the truth at all. I have nothing against Shug. He's yeah. just very much a polarizing figure. And, um, you know, he has created this whole persona for himself single-handedly that, yeah. you know, ultimately has, you know, I think led to where he is right now. Yeah, it's so sad, bro. Like, I wish, you know, I wish I was thinking better back then, and I wish he was, too. I wish all of us was, man, because it's like, when you look back on it, it's like, what was it all for? You know what I'm saying? Like, it's like, you know. Yeah. It's like, ugh, it's an ugly situation, bro. Oh, yeah. I mean, Mob James said that at the end of the day, none of the bloods that associated themselves with death row had anything left at the very end. We ain't got one millionaire. We ain't got one thousand dollars. We ain't got not one, not one man prospered from that. Not one. Everybody is back where they at. And and when I say that, a lot of people give me twisted and saying that I'm bitching about what we got paid or where, where we at. Take your licks. I take my licks. I'm the first one to admit that if 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 I can do this again. I, I would I get paid, and everybody else would be getting paid, but everybody knew what the outcome of this was going to be pretty much. Because when Suge went to jail, Suge took back everything. I heard everything was leased under death row, from what I heard. Mm -hmm. The houses and the cars, all the vehicles, all the homes were all somehow attached to their corporation and leased to the artists, yeah, and the bodyguards or whoever. But yeah, that's from Suge. That's from Snoop. You know, on down, I heard everything was leased. Yeah, someone pointed out, you know, in the song, um, Two of America's Most Wanted. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't think this is what it means, but it just sounds kind of interesting now that w when, when you look at it. When Snoop says, and uh, I think I got a black Beamer. And it's oh, like, I think did he I think got... he had a black Beamer because it was leased? <laughs> he thought he had one. Mm. Right. I'm not, I'm not sure. Snoop is smart. <laughs> Snoop is an intelligent guy, so you know, never know. Trust me. Yeah, he may. Yeah, he may even sneak this in. You know, what I'm saying mm -hmm. in that verse me. without anybody catching on. Because oh, he yeah. wasn't gonna do it openly, so yeah. <laughs> right. Well, since last time we talked, mm -hmm. the whole Takashi Six Nine arrest wow. happened. That's so sad, too, man. Did you see the interview with uh, that I did with Sarah Molina, Takashi's baby mother, where she read the actual guilty plea? No, I didn't. Well, we got a copy of the guilty plea before for the interview, and I actually had to read it on camera. The defendant's obligation under this agreement are as follows: that he shall truthfully and completely disclose. all information of the activities of himself and others to the U.S. Attorney's Office, that he, will co that he will cooperate fully with the New York City Police Department, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, Homeland Security Investigations, and other law enforcement agencies. You want me to keep going? Yeah, keep going. 
that he shall attend all meetings of the office, that he shall provide to the office upon request any document that shall truthfully testify before the grand jury or at any trial, that he shall bring the office's attention all crimes which he has committed, and that he shall commit no further crimes. Okay, and just and read the next uh, paragraph, and that'll be it. If the defendant does this, the office, and this is detailed on page four, on pages four and five of the agreement, agrees not to prosecute the defendant for the crimes set forth in courts in counts one through nine of superseding information, as well as additional crimes that the defendant has told the government about. Mm, mm, mm. The little rainbow hair kid, huh? The little rainbow hair kid. Mm, mm, mm. So sad. Wow. Have you seen this type of thing happen before? Mm, not, not in this instant. No, I can't say. I mean, I've seen it in the gang. You know, in the instant of gang. You know, the gang environment, kind of. Yeah. I've seen stuff like this. Yeah. An old guy from a gang in L.A. Like a, he would be considered an OG. You know what I mean? He have to be at least fifty, almost sixty years old. That kind of pretty much was in this situation, like in recent years too. <laughs> yeah. Like he seriously. told on everybody. Oh my God. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now here's where it gets a little fuzzy because I've seen other like lawyers online kind of dispute this a little bit, saying that even though it sounds like this, they can't really comprehend Takashi just walking away and them dropping all the charges and so forth. Why not? If he telling, if he if he's if he's given his statement you know, in, in, in helping convict his friends, then why not? How? I mean, just just because you're a lawyer don't mean nothing. Okay. Every situation, they're not all the same situations. You know what I mean? It's pretty much what the DA and the lawyers agree to. If his lawyer agreed to it, the DA agreed to it, there's nothing no, no, nobody else can say. And this is where I have a problem with it. Because, you know, I've, I've said outright, you know, if you try to rob me or you attack me, I'm, I'm calling the police. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I have no problems doing that. I, I consider myself a civilian. Yeah, you're you not know? a part of nothing, bro. Like, if I was a civilian, I would too. Right. Any any civilian could do whatever they choose, yo. Like, right. come on. Yeah. Right. I've, I've, I've put that out there, and, and I stand behind it to this day. Mm -hmm. But this is a very different situation because if you look at this whole thing— all these guys were doing these crimes, you know, for Takashi, for all the beefs that he was starting. Mm -hmm. He was the one beefing with everybody. Like, he's well, on camera that, I beefing. Don't see, I don't even know what they're in. I don't even know exactly what the case is that they have him on. They have him on cases since he's came out as a rapper and been signed to this label. They've been committing crimes since. Yes. Oh, okay. That's different then. See, there's a video where he's where he's uh there's a TMZ video where he's beefing with Chief Keef's cousin Tato. Okay, and then the shooting happened, so they got him. For some well, and time. then well, he's beefing with him like on Facetime. They're like you know, mm -hmm. yelling back and forth to each other. He hangs up, and he goes, uh, "I got a twenty pack on that." Mm. And and right afterwards, this dude, well, right afterwards, Chief Keef's I think Chief Keef gets shot at mm -hmm. in New York. And after Takashi gets hemmed up with everyone else, Takashi actually ID'd the shooter as his friend, Kuda B, who he, he made a song about. Like, God. there's a song called Kuda. Like, they were that close. Like, Takashi's baby mother said, like... The only reason I feel Kuda would have did it was off the strength of his relationship with Danny. I don't even think it was just more the money. You know, is. He has a whole song named after him. I've seen Kuda's been in the house that got raided. You know? He's been around. So it's just like you told him to do something and he did it out of love for you and now you're snitching on him. And this is where I have the problem. To me, it'd be like this. Me and Adam 22 were talking about this the other day. Let's say I sold you a kilo of cocaine. Mm -hmm. And then I called the police to report you for buying a kilo of cocaine that I just I sold you. It, right? And then you go to prison, and I walk away because I because I'm cooperating That's entrapment. with the police. That's what that was the old entrapment thing that they used to do to uh, us in California. 
Like, that's what they would do. Like, the police would come and buy drugs from you. Or they'll set up a, like, you know, they'll set up sting operations with prostitutes where it'll be an undercover police. And you'll pull up and try to get the girl, and then you'll get arrested. So that's entrapment, right. pretty much. <laughs> well, well, right. But but you expect the police to do that. This is what this is the police's job to try to get people arrested. Yeah, but that's I mean, but, come on. Not if you set the rock house up. Like if you make the rock house and then somebody a, a fiend come and purchase the rock and you sell it to him. That's that's crazy. Yeah. And, and this is where <laughs> I had the problem. It's like this th- th- this young kid Kuda might end up doing like 15 or 20 years. Mm. Because he did something that Takashi told him to do and paid him to do. I mean, you know, he should have known what to, like, in my, you know, in my opinion, um, I don't know how him, how well they know each other. But, you know, the people that I've grown up with or I ran with, I pretty much know their character, yo. So was he just trying to, like, get some cool points from the kid or what was it? Are, are they childhood friends? Like, what's the, what's the deal? Nah, nah. Uh, I mean, the way the way Sarah Molina, who's Takashi's baby mother, you know, described it was that... He was never really gangbanging before he met the people he met. He wasn't really okay. selling no drugs. He wasn't, you know, that's just not what he was doing. Okay, so how did you feel when out of the blue, suddenly he's got red rags and he's saying blood and he's waving it around and everything else like that? Um, It made me question. I had to ask him, I'm like, yo, you blood? Like, is this what you're doing now? Like, I just want to know out of curiosity because he was going so hard with it. Um, But he told me he, he wasn't. And I guess it was just for fashion, I guess, like. These are the dudes that he's rolling with. They're holding him down. So I guess he's representing. I don't know. Like, that's how I saw it. That's so sad, man. You know, and right now, if you read through his, his plea agreement, you know, his guilty guilty plea agreement, he's, you know, painting himself as a victim. Like, oh, I'm a, just a young kid and I've had a traumatic childhood. He's sharp. And my my father-in-law doing- got killed. He's you sharp know, if he's but, doing this all on his own, yeah. He's so smart. Oh, yeah. If he didn't sit up yeah. here and got all this stuff started and then pushed everybody out and he could still walk free, like, he's a cold little devil, if you ask me. Oh, yeah. And and the thing is, is that he's painting himself as being manipulated by all these, like, older gangster dudes. Well, but he can say she... that because, look, look at what you just said. He just started yeah. all of a sudden. So it could be looked like they brainwashed him. You know what I mean? Right. But what she said was that ultimately he manipulated them. Like, really, I kind of feel really sad because I feel like in a way these grown men were manipulated by this little rainbow head kid. They was manipulated by money. It was manipulated by a lifestyle that they were now a part of just by being with him. You know, it's just like you said, money and fame will make people do a lot of things. Maybe so. <laughs> That's so funny. Wow. They fell for the okie doke, man, if you ask me. Like, that was silly, bro. Like, I saw a lot of that online stuff on Instagram, and I was just like, who are these people, yo? Like, the the, the brothers that was in the background taking up for him. I was like, yo, they was trying to justify a lot of that crap, man. I was like, we'll see how it plays out, and, and look where they at. Yeah, yeah, man, it's, it's crazy. And, uh, you know... I talked to China Mac and I said, do you think, you know, if Takashi tells on everyone gets out, do you think you still have a rap career in 2019? He said, yo, it hurts me to say this. Really does. It really hurts me. But yes. And it just shows you just where it's at now. Like, you know what I mean? It's really disgusting to me. You know what I'm saying? Um, because I really firmly believe that if you're not in the streets, then stay the fuck out of the streets. Like, you know what I mean? You can't play in this shit. And then when it happens, you just like, you know, if you with it, you with it. If you're not with it, you're not with it. Like, you know what I mean? I really hate to see these fucking stupid ass kids just be doing all this shit and they not built for it. And you know what I'm saying? And then they fucking, and then they fold like a beach, beach shit. So I, honestly, I think like the the, the 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 way the game, the way the world, the way everything is all set up now, yes, he's going to come back out 
and people aren't even going to care about it. The streets will care about it. You know what I'm saying? But um but so he can never come back like on like his gangster street stuff. But uh I definitely think he he could come out and just make like, you know, like, you know, make rock and like, whatever type of music and just do it for the ladies and do it for the clubs. And I think people's going to jack it. Yeah, Troy, I have do, right? He still got a rap career, making videos, songs, hot, and all that. So I don't know. I mean, come on, man. This 2019, Vlad. Snoop couldn't have got away with it if he would have got convicted in the 90s, right? Or just for whatever, if he would have told on everybody and tried to come back out, it couldn't have happened. Nowadays, probably so. The way the world is set up, yeah, he'd probably be the hottest thing out. <laughs> I'm telling you. Yeah. Yeah, well, because most of his fans are not street guys. They're just exactly. regular kids who like music. And you There know. you go. Yeah, well, we're going to see what happens, man. Me, personally, I don't, I don't, I'm not feeling none of this shit. I see you the little I mean? dude like, from Hoover, the, uh, the little rapper from L.A. that was riding with him. He, he backed all the way up, huh? Remember it was a little guy that was putting out? He was from Hoover, he was from L.A.? I don't remember. Was it, yeah, was he got all Q? the way out the way. <clears throat> I forget his name, about, uh, but I mean the only only Hoover rapper I know is what Schoolboy Q. No, not a TDE no. guy. He was he was Treyway. It was a Treyway dude. Let me see. He from LA. He from Hoover. I think he from Five or something. But I see he got he's smart because he got right out the way. Man, what people do for fame, man. Fame and money. Yeah, man, it's sad. It's so very sad. sad. I had this thing that happened, uh, I think it was a couple months ago. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you caught wind of it or not. But I had posted, I'd actually found a copy of Easy E's obituary. Whose? Easy, Easy E's obituary. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah, I caught wind of it. You mm -hmm. caught wind of it. So I posted up Easy E's obituary, mm -hmm. and, you know, I, I gave the, the RIP Easy E and so forth. And, you know, anybody who knows me, knows that Easy is a very important figure in my life. Okay. You know, I'm, I'm a huge fan. I've interviewed uh, his son. Yeah. I've also interviewed a bunch of his artists. Yeah. Including you. Yeah. And I went on in the caption to say that, that AIDS is real and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's, you know, you should get tested if you're not using condoms. There's also home tests called OraQuick. Mm -hmm. There is uh, pills called Truvada, which potentially, you know, could stop you know, uh, the spread of AIDS if you come in contact with it and so forth. And, uh, you know, I used, I used the caption to, you know, to spread AIDS awareness. And Easy es youngest daughter mm -hmm. did a video, uh, you know, she was upset with me saying that I know for a fact that Easy didn't die of AIDS and I shouldn't be using her father as, as the face of AIDS awareness and so forth. Yeah. Yeah, uh, we do, I mean, we don't like that, bro. Like, I don't like it, honestly. I don't like people to say that because nobody know for sure. You see what I'm saying? So it's one thing to say to say that the media, you know, their push kind of like overshadowed the truth. You know what I'm saying? By them just saying that and everybody ran with it. You know, a lot of people might still think that that's the bottom line, but the closer that we got to the facts, yo, and just being a logical, rational human being, bro, it just doesn't add up. So in that case, I wouldn't, you know what I mean? And then that's my friend and that's that's her dad. So come on, you know, and then they just got out of like arbitration with Tamika, you know, Eric and some people in his family and a couple of people that I know. And it almost came out, the truth almost came out. You know what I'm saying? Because it goes that deep. You see what I'm saying? So that's why she spoke what she spoke. She knows. She knows a different story. That's why me and my brother sit here and say what we said. We know a different story. You see what I'm mm -hmm. saying? So in that case, yeah, it's not. You know, it's cool to spread AIDS awareness, man, because it's 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 a it's an epidemic. It needs to be spoke about. People need to protect themselves. But I think that stigma on my friend, my mentor, somebody that I love, it's not cool because it overshadowed his legacy. It's like that became a bigger of a deal than what he actually contributed to music, hip hop. You know, he doesn't give he doesn't even get spoke of in the same vein as a Biggie and a Tupac when they probably looked up to him. You see what I'm saying? 
And I think that's what it all stemmed from, yo. It's like <clears throat> he got this negative stigma attached to his name that probably never go away. And then people won't let it go away because they keep attaching it and attaching it. And it's just not true, man. We just don't have the facts. Number one, to be fair, mm -hmm. he had a final statement that was read by his lawyer. That's not true, though. Who wrote it? See what I'm saying? How can you write a statement when you have a whole respirator pumping your lungs and shit? That's what I'm trying to tell you, yo. It's like, come on. Like, it's, you know, like those people, that lawyer is complicit in this, in this case. That lady is complicit in this case. And some other people, yo. You understand what I'm saying? So it's like, who knows? Wasn't nobody there. Wasn't nobody there, bro, to really know for sure. We know he couldn't write. He didn't sign his, he didn't sign the marriage certificate. We know that. His name is typed on it. Hmm. Hmm. See? His death certificates say cardiac arrest also. So why they why they're not saying he died from cardiac arrest? You see what I'm saying? Well, it don't say cardiac arrest due to a complications with the AIDS virus. It just says cardiac arrest. You see what I'm saying? And that's just come on. So yeah, I can understand it. I can definitely understand why Riri said what she said. He did have a final statement, and we we don't we don't know who wrote it. Mm -hmm. You know, but we know he didn't write it. We know that for a fact. It wasn't in his handwriting. And you can find you can probably find it. And okay. I can show you how he wrote. He wrote like like somebody that does graffiti. You <laughs> understand what I'm saying? And I doubt if he read that letter in, in that handwriting. I, I I honestly do. Well well someone someone who was really is really like a super fan of mm -hmm. Easy. Uh, a guy named Lando Coleman. Mm -hmm. uh, he emailed me. And, and he actually kind of broke down the timeline of what happened. Mm -hmm. He said, uh, Easy e was first admitted to Norwalk Community Hospital on 2 6 95. He mm -hmm. was released 2 19 95, three days later, because he didn't feel better. I was okay. So, okay, okay. So he was, he came in 2 16, February 16th, 95, was mm -hmm. released February 19th, 1995. When he was in there for that, that first time, he came straight from the hospital to the studio with me. Straight from the hospital, from the hospital to the pharmacy to the studio with me. Okay, but he was in for three days. That's that's quite a stint. I don't at a know hospital. if it was three, but maybe. I know they kept him overnight. He didn't tell me it was three days though, but he just said okay. overnight. Okay, so then this guy w went on to say, uh, because he didn't feel better, he was admitted back. He was, he was admitted to Cedar Sinai on February twenty fourth, ninety five. He did feel better. Cause that's why they let him up. So he felt better. He came to the studio, and in the in in about a hour and a half time of him being in the studio, his lungs collapsed, and then he was admitted back. That's when I told the bodyguards, you know, his breathing wasn't cool to come and grab him, and they took him and put him in a in a car and drove him to the hospital. Okay. Well, yeah. according to this email, so he was admitted to Cedar Sinai on February twenty fourth. Mm -hmm. A few days later. And he was diagnosed with full-blown AIDS on March 1st, 95. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the word hit the street the next day because uh, the nurses at Cedars. And then the, the press conference was uh, 3-16-95. Exactly. So basically 15 days later. Yeah, his condition was terrible at that time, yo. He was not breathing on his own at this point. It's, that's the whole point that I'm trying to tell you. He, he, a respirator, you know, he had all that shit in his nose and his mouth. He was hardly ever conscious, mm. hardly ever. You know what I'm saying? So, so come so on. So you man. were in, you were in the hospital with him. I was as there a lot, bro. This. Like, come on, the first the first week, every day, and then it got so chaotic that I never went inside no more because they start changing the rules. They took him from one room to another room and just start changing everything. It just became complicated. You know what I mean? Well, listen, I I think you have very valid points. Mm-hmm. And I guess that ultimately we, we don't we don't quite know. Um, I could sincerely, you know, black women in particular are some of the most hit by mm -hmm. by AIDS in America. And it could be a conspiracy too, though, Vlad. You, you know, know what I'm saying? And and for me, every all of that came from a good place. I get what you're saying. Like I I, I, I was trying I know you're to not tell a malicious everyone, person, bro. I know this. No. You know no. what I'm saying? So I didn't take it that way. 
But I understood her because, you know, this is this is this man's child. You know what I'm saying? Like I said, yeah. she have different information. You see right. what I'm saying? Because Little Easy actually does age charity stuff too. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? And he kind of run on that platform. You know what I'm saying? That it was associated with his dad. But he know that, you know, he know the truth ultimately like she does. You know what I'm saying? So I get it. You know, it's a good thing. But it's like, yo, I think that, I think them doing that. It's like, come on, man. They probably did a study before they did it and probably knew the outcome of it because all that stuff overshadowed the legacy of Eric Wright, Easy e bro. It, it kind of did. Because come mm. on, come on, come on, Vlad. He came out, he was what? Besides him and Russell Simmons, probably the only CEOs of, 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 of record labels that had major hits, you know what I'm saying? From the 80s to the 90s until Suge and them came around, right? And then all the artists that he affected, bro, all the artists Dr. Dre affected, every artist Eminem affected, every artist 50 Cent affected, just think about it. Like, that's his legacy. But they never speak about these things. You see what I'm saying? Like, it's, it's, not, spoke of, it's not spoken of in the hip-hop circuit on the level that it should be. You know, the OGs love Eric. I saw it, man. I saw how Karis one of them treated him, Kumo D. All the people, you know what I'm saying, from the, from the origins of this thing. And the fact that, you know, in the media, you know, the magazines, the publications, the online, he's just not giving the credit, man. And that's just, that's the sad part to me. You know, at the very least, man, it's easy E, bro. Like, think about it. They beat the feds with the freedom of speech thing. That's mm -hmm. a huge deal for hip hop. Oh, yeah. Right? Just like Run DMC and LL Cool J paved a lot of, you know, they opened a lot of doors for artists, right? That's huge. Easy e pretty much made it possible for us to keep speaking what we feel on music because it got to the federal government and they tried to stop it. And nobody gives them the credit. <clears throat> well, yeah, I think what ultimately happened, and the people my age, we all understand that Easy yeah, e I get it. was the, the root of really the entire West Coast family tree. But I think that ultimately with him dying, Dr. Dre kind of got the credit. I mean, they speak of Dre more in the terms of producing. But Dre, is, he's more than that, too. Dre is an yeah. artist. You know what I'm saying? Dre is on the very first music that came out from N.W.A., bro. Like, uh -huh. And, you know, he's more than just that also. I mean, he's he don't get spoke of in the same, you know, in a proper uh, fashion either. You know what I'm saying? When it comes to hip hop, bro, he doesn't. You know, like you said, to the OGs, yeah, I mean, we talk about it, but it's not, you know, the publications, man. It's like, come on, man, these are the these are the pioneers of this genre that we call hip hop, yo. And they just get overshadowed. Even the even Cool Herc and all those people, man, like they just don't get the credit. You know, it's just sad. Well, listen, man, I, I think you make some good points. And um you know, I'm not one to, to hold my tongue or, or take back what I say, but I think based on what you're telling me, you know, I'm going to apologize to Easy's family. Appreciate it, bro. You know, for, for uh, you know, saying some things that may not be as black and white as I thought they were. Yeah, appreciate it. We appreciate it. I'll, I'll, I'll accept it on their behalf because I'm sure they the, would too. The, 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 there you go. There you go. And, uh, you know, shout out to Lil Easy and uh, the rest of Easy's family. I, mean, I think he had, what, uh, 11 kids now? Yeah. yeah, 11, yeah. Yeah, there's actually two kids named Yeah, Eric. we always knew. I mean, I've always knew it was 11, although I didn't know who all the 11 were. But that's before he passed away, I knew it was 11. I know the kids well, didn't know, but I did. Okay, well, in that, in that final letter that, that was read, he said seven. That's what I'm trying to tell you. See what I'm trying yeah. to tell you? See what I'm saying? You see? Because that lady wasn't as close to him, bro. Like, Tamika was not... He didn't know her for that long, yo. Like, we didn't even know her. She didn't come out until the in, until he was in the hospital. This is when everybody knew who Tamika was. You see what I'm saying? So she didn't even know him that well. So there you go. There How you do go. I know he got 11 and she say 7? <laughs> like, come on. Mm. Okay. Exactly. I interviewed Freeway Ricky uh, recently, and uh, he told me something kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. Because in his case, uh, he had a plug 
named uh, Louis Blandone. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, they were literally moving millions of dollars worth of cocaine, which ended up being tied into the whole Iran-Contra thing, and it mm -hmm. was just, you know, it was a really a massive cover-up. I'm really, a, on I'm a, really a, familiar with that story. Yeah, on an international level. Mm -hmm. and, and Louis Blandone was actually working with the government, took the stand against Freeway Ricky, and gave him life in prison mm -hmm. based on, you know, his particular testimony and the whole, the whole issue at hand. Ultimately, Freeway Ricky, who was illiterate at the time that he got locked up, learned how to read in prison, and then managed to find a loophole in his case and got out after, I think, about 20 years. Yeah, or 20 years, yeah. Mm -hmm. When I asked him what he would do if Louis Blandone, who snitched on him, walked in the room right now, he said absolutely nothing. What would happen if he walked in the room right now? Oh, nothing. Nothing. I have absolutely nothing against him. Really? No. Nah. Wasn't his fault. See, the way I look at it is, first of all, I made the mistake of getting in the drug business. That was my first mistake. Mm -hmm. My next mistake was I went back into the drug business as I said I quit. Yeah. So what he did is he only did what people do in the drug business. They tell. They set you up. Hmm. And for somebody to go into the drug business and not understand that, which I was in the drug business and didn't understand it, mm -hmm. um, but I came to grips with it. They were pawns in them, and they, they re Rick realized he was a pawn in their game, and he knew that guy was a pawn in their game. So why would he? Yeah. Why would he? I mean, 20 years is a lot. You can't never get it back. But the fact that he's been blessed to come home and his life is headed in another direction and mentally he's not in that space. So why would he do something? Well, what he said was interesting. He said that once he was in prison, he fully accepted his the fact that he was in prison because of cocaine. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that was his mistake, that he chose to deal with cocaine. And he also realized that snitching is a part of the drug trade. Absolutely. It became that way. It wasn't supposed to be. Because how can you have a drug trade if you got snitching? You can't be successful with snitches, you know what I'm saying? So, But it became that way. I get it. Well, the drug trade is not designed for you to be successful. It is. It's supposed to be. <laughs> supposed to be, yeah, but I mean, really... I mean, come on, man. It's, it's no different than what the government did when they came and took the country. You see what I'm saying? They came yeah. and did it illegally. They used a bunch of different things in their disposal to, to gain control of this landmass. The mob pretty much did the same thing in, the, in cities that they were in. And now they're all corporate. I live in Vegas. They corporate now. So they don't have to continue, you know, living by the same way that they did when they first came. And so, you know, it's the same situation if you think about it. I mean, drugs was supposed to bring money. Like the people that was in the drug trade was supposed to go, go clean after a certain point. You know, that's the way that we were taught. But I think sometimes people get, you know, the money goes to people's head. You know, the money, the power, and all the other bull crap that comes along with it. And people kind of lose sight of it, I guess. Because who, I mean, who, who's you... going to be a drug dealer forever? Like, who says that? Well, how many drug dealers do you know that never got snitched on? I know a few. I mean, I know quite a few. It's just that they were smart. You know what I'm saying? Because this is what I know. So, and Rick probably can tell you. <clears throat> so back when cocaine hit, you know, naturally if it started, just say California with Rick, it has to move now because, you know, they're only making so much money here. They have to expand. It's like big business, right? So what they did back in those days is that when they expanded to other states, they would party with each other. Now people know, you know, such and such from Chicago, such and such from St. Louis, such and such from New York. So now everybody is pretty much tapped in. And then now that they're partying together, now just say the guy in New York gets snatched. He don't want to go and do 120 years for all these, you know what I mean? So he tell. So what he going to do? He going to tell on the dude from somewhere else. You see what I'm saying? Now they go watch him. Boom. He get hit. Then everybody just started pointing fingers. You know what I'm saying? And it, eventually, you know, it's gonna, the ball going to roll down to you if you ain't got told on yet. 
Well, you used to sell drugs yeah. when you were younger. Mm -hmm. hey, did you get snitched on? A lot of times, yeah. A lot but I never times. had a lot of cocaine like these guys. I didn't. I wasn't. Listen, I'm scared of cocaine. Like a lot of cocaine. Like I, I used to only have like nine ounces. That's as far as I would go, because it would make me so nervous just to look at it or have it in my person. I didn't really try. I wasn't trying to sell cocaine to be a baller, or to try to be nobody, bro. I was literally feeding myself and taking care of myself with the money I was making. So yeah, I ain't never dealt with nothing like Rick. Okay, but even with that, you got snitched on. Absolutely. How many times? Hmm. Probably about three or four times in my lifetime, yeah. People you knew? No. It wasn't nobody I knew. Well, people I knew, but it wasn't like it wasn't no people that was in like in my lifestyle. It was like either smokers or neighbors, you know, people just tired of the traffic. It was stuff like that. Yeah. Okay, but not 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 the situation like where you're talking about. No, no, no. Okay, so so your code co defendants never snitched no. on you. But what he basically said is that, and I, and I think he has a very good point, is that snitching is really part of drug dealing. Like if you're going to get into in, into drug dealing, and assume that you will never get snitched on, you are going to crash and burn. <laughs> see, he got a lot of see now. That's that's him talking in hindsight. See. Mm -hmm. But you can't tell. You couldn't have told him that back in the day. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He would have probably did a whole lot of different things. You feel me? And anybody, just say if somebody decided I'm going to be a drug dealer right now, today, in 2019, and they know this. Like, they had to be crazy. Like, you'd have to be a, a plum fool to dive into this game. Like, mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I mean, especially yeah. with the level of surveillance. Yeah. Uh, cell phones, tr cell phone tracking, cameras fucking everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, motherfucking eyes in the sky mm -hmm. that, that they probably, they can't be using a court of law, but it'll tell you exactly what you need to know exactly. off the record. Uh, yeah, not, yeah it's man. not wise, bro. Like, I don't know. I mean, I understand that at one point, you know, in the ghetto, it it, it was what it was, but it's like... I think like in 2019, and it's just me, it might be like a selfish way to look at it, but I think, man, you don't have to do nothing illegal in order to make it no more, bro. Like, I just don't think you have to. Now, I understand like some people are, you know, their situations are different. People are in different situations and their circumstances might have them trapped. Some people are trapped by circumstance. And then I know a lot of people in the ghetto, they just don't know the options that they have because they haven't presented many. You see what I'm saying? They haven't been presented with many different options and different things to do. So people are trapped by circumstance and mentality more so than anything. But it's too easy nowadays to do something legitimate to make money, bro. You know what I'm saying? Like, so I don't know. Yeah, man, just don't do it. Yeah, don't do I, it. I try, I, to, I try to get this... Uh, <laughs> Mm -hmm. You know, I try to get this message across in my interviews. People think right. I glorify this shit. I don't glorify it. I, I, I've never told anyone to do this shit. I mean, you got to right. understand, media-wise, it's it's a fascination with the lifestyle, bro. I mean, it always been. That's what turned a lot of Los Angeles out with Scarface. You know what I mean? Mm. Those movies, The King of New York that I see people speak about, you know, it kind of like changed the um, the terrain a little. You know what I mean? And how things have start start moving down there, but... Yeah, I wouldn't advise nobody to get in nothing streetwise, yo. Like, it's just too savage. It ain't no love in it. There's no code of honesty. They tell you that, but it's not there. You know what I'm saying? Well, listen, you know, like, when you look at the Jesse Smullett case, you yeah. know, how he tried to fake his, his own attack. He's a terrible person for that, man. <laughs> that guy right there. I've been, I've been clowning him, too. <laughs> <laughs> on my Instagram, man, I've been clowning the hell out of Jesse, bro, because, you know, I don't think he understood the ramifications of what he did when he did it, bro. You understand what I'm saying? That these are things yeah. that happen for real in real life to real people, and then here you go with a publicity stunt that went wrong. Yeah, you're supposed to get everything you got coming, bro. Well, I actually watched the the press release, you know, with the, with the Chicago police. Mm-hmm where they, they talked about the case. And, you know, I think when he did it, 
you know, they talked about how he kind of cased the area out. There was only one camera there, and, you know, the guys walked away with their back turned. Mm -hmm. So it was like, you know, he felt like, okay, I, I've planned this, this crime out all the way through, and I'm not going to get caught. And the police, let me tell you, in that press conference, yeah. they were so surgical in the way they broke this shit down mm -hmm. that they basically like reverse engineered it. They found the car that they left at and then checking cameras from where they arrived and then check the check the car coming back to the you know, location. One thing about and, this though, Vlad, that I agree with other people, especially the people that's from Chicago, they talk about this stuff and you seen what you just said, how surgical they were. But what about all the cases that they didn't solve with the little black girls in Chicago and all the kids that are missing and just, why they ain't surgical about that? That's way more important than Jesse Smollett, bro. And that's just my opinion. Because all those other cases didn't get the media attention of Jesse. I get that's it. That's why. But I think they're that's more why. serious because they're, they're dead. there's dead bodies, yo. It's like there's missing people. There's missing human life that's unaccounted for. I mean, I think that's more serious than Jesse, man. That's just my opinion. I agree. I completely agree. And uh, ultimately, I mean, he's, you know, he hasn't had his trial yet. And so we'll see what ultimately happens. But it, it appears that he faked the whole thing. But it just goes to show, you know, with all the cameras, they could reverse, you know, they could work out the path in reverse to see where everyone went. They also got his cell phone records and the two Nigerian brothers' cell phone records that and cross like reference where, where they, they were. That's they had to use, though. You see what I'm saying? That's <laughs> because I know they don't have the technology at the police force. I mean, at the police station or the precinct down there to do all that stuff. So that sounds like a lot of state dollars from Chicago that they're using for this little petty ass Jesse Smollett crap, man. Like, that's kind of sad to me, man. But yeah, I get what you're saying. Like, it's not, it's just, you know, it's not wise to be in the world doing nothing crazy, bro. <laughs> It's not, man. And listen, you know, we live in a society now where police you could go. Nice. Yeah. But, you know, but you could go work for Postmates if you don't want to get a regular job. You could, exactly. you know, do, do Uber. Something. You could like, do so you don't many got different no ways. Today, bro. It ain't too many yeah. excuses today for you not to. You know what I mean? You can say what you want. No. Nah. If Mexicans, nah. if they can stand on the side of freeways with oranges, bro, if they got enough dignity to do that. You should have enough dignity to get your ass up and go and try to find a job. I don't care if you just pick up trash. Like, do something. But you don't have yeah. to do crime. We don't need no more crime, bro. It's too much of it. Yeah, it's just, come on, man. And, and we need to start at the government level anyway when it comes to that because I think the biggest crimes are done there, <clears throat> if you ask me. 100%. Mm -hmm. 100%. Have you been following the YNW Melly situation? Who is this? This is a rapper, uh, I believe, out of Florida, where uh, he claimed that you know his two friends got killed in a drive-by, and he killed them. The little weird kid with the dreads. Yeah, yeah. The police Bro, are saying that he actually killed them. And he drove around with their dead bodies, and then he's still out making music and stuff. Is, or no, is he's he already, no, no. He's he's locked up right now with no bail. Mm. That's insane, man. Yeah. Um, the police are saying that he shot them while they were all in the car together Whoa. and he drove around with their dead bodies and then I guess made it look like a drive-by and it, it didn't quite work out. Whoa. Mm, mm, mm. Cold piece of work. Yeah. And wow. you know, he has songs like Murder on My Mind, which went number one right after he got yeah, locked I've up. Yeah, I've been seeing people been trying to tell me, man, but I like, you know... Like, music like that, honestly, and even though I come from that stuff, bro, I try to, like, veer away from it. Like, too much negative, like, negative music, like, in that sense to where, like, if it's a situation where this guy had supposedly killed his friends, right, and spoke about it, you know, I guess, I don't know, pumped himself up or, envision, you know, envisioned it before he did it. I'm not going to listen to that music, bro. I don't want nothing to do with it. You know what I'm saying? And so people have been trying to make me listen to him. I'm like, why would you want me to listen to that after you didn't just gave me this story? I don't want to hear it. That's not cool. You know, that don't sit well with me, you know? So that's well, crazy. I mean, I mean, we talked about this just now, but in the world of forensics, 
<laughs> forensic yeah. technology and so forth. You're gonna you're gonna be very hard pressed to try to fake a murder and try yeah. to somehow stage a fake murder scene with blood splatters and DNA evidence right. and hair samples and everything else like that. Like the, the the fuck are you even doing right now? Right. Yeah, he tripping. That guy is crazy. Whoever he is, man, like I don't want nothing to do with it, honestly. Yeah, I mean, he looks crazy. He looks yeah, like he mugshot. Like, I he's seen smiling in the dress. mugshot. He be wearing dresses and all type of weird stuff. Like, that shit is weird, man. Like, he probably unstable mentally or something. Did you know people growing up who just, you know, were like serial killers who ended yep. up ultimately getting caught because they really liked killing people? Yep. I know quite a few. Yeah. Honestly, yeah. And I, and you know, it's funny how when you grow up with people, and you know when you're a child, man, everything seems innocent. You know what I'm saying? Like you and your friends. And then when you guys get older, yo, it's like, yo. And you have real conversations, you be like, what happened to you? You know what I mean? Like, what happened to you that you that made you go out go so left? You know what I mean? So yeah, I do, man. I do know people like that, bro. Honestly, I do. They like it, and they're probably, you know, yeah. It's crazy, yeah, I do. But you knew them as kids before they started doing yeah, that stuff. Yeah, like these are some people that I grew up with, man. Like they just went left at some point, like mentally. How many people, you know, like if you look at the one, like the most extreme case, how many people did that person get convicted for killing ultimately? Um, Just a couple. Just a couple on on the what he got convicted for, but <clears throat> yeah. But he was probably. You're saying that he was allegedly connected to a whole bunch of other ones. Man, come on, man, just, bro. Okay. Just you know, just if you just have to know the individual, man, like to know. You know, because I mean, you would have to know. Like everybody, don't everybody that know these people don't know them in this way. You know what I mean? Because usually. Serial killer uh, type people, you know, they, they act really good. You know what I'm saying? Around other people. Even in their own family, people don't know. You know, they play a role real well. You know what I mean? So, yeah. <clears throat> well, you know, I mean, you look at today's society and, uh, you know, murder is considered this horrible thing and, you know, people... You know, it is a horrible thing, Vlad. It, 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 well, well, <laughs> very well let, let me let me Murder just. Murder is nothing, just, nothing nice about that, bro. It's well, crazy. but then again, you look at someone who's a quote unquote war hero mm -hmm. who's killed fifty or sixty yeah, people. Yeah, but see, that's why you shouldn't. It's not supposed to be that, man. I think you know. I think that's a that's a wrong thing. Like that's that's something a war hero, war and hero shouldn't even go together. Like. It'd be one thing, like, if somebody came to invade and then, you know, caught us off guard or, preempt, you know, preempted us or something like that, and then we overcame them, then, yeah, they would can be considered heroes. But if you meet somebody on the battlefield and one win, come on, that's not necessarily a hero. It was, you know what I'm saying? And, and then war is not pretty, bro, no matter how you look right. at it. Death is not right. pretty. Even when you have to kill somebody that's negative, like a serial killer. It's still not a pretty thing because that's still with somebody's child, yo. You still what I'm saying? He might have still had children that might have loved him. You see? So it's just not a pretty. I wouldn't, I wouldn't like, yeah, war hero. I, that don't even sound good. Right, but I'm saying, but it's all perspective, right? I mean, think about how many people Obama yeah, yeah, killed. Yeah, of course. That's just you know, one, during one the eight thing. during the eight years he was in office, how mm -hmm. how many drone strikes was Obama responsible for? Then? I don't follow them, Vlad. Like I, I'm not a um. I'm not big on politics, bro, because I, I know it's all evil, man. Like, I don't think Obama was righteous, bro. I, I look at him like George Bush. He ain't no different to me. You know what I'm saying? Like, just because he black. Like, he he's a devil, too, if you ask me. That's just my opinion. And and I know that, I know most of uh, so-called black people, I don't even like to say this word no more, because black is not a nationality. It's a, it's a status. You know, it's like it's like a citizenship or a classification. Um. <clears throat> Obama was the president of Har of the Harvard Law School or something like that, right? So he knows the law. And uh, he Harvard knows Harvard Law Harvard Law, law Review, Review or something like a that, group, right? Yeah. So he knows law, and he knows that 
the entrapments that have come with, you know, that have that have surrounded black people in the inner cities of the United States of America, bruh, it's all twisted in the law. He know what all the traps are. And he never spoke not once about it. And then he'll speak about something like Morocco is the first country that recognized America as an independent nation, right? But he won't give you the background information of why. You see what I'm saying? He won't talk about the uh, the, the peace treaty of, of the peace treaty of what is it? Of some peace and friendship with us in Morocco, the longest treaty that ever you know on the planet. Um, he won't say these things, and he won't tell he won't tell the people that we shouldn't call ourselves African American or Black, because these are statuses, yo. And then if you read what they mean in the law, they have very negative connotations to them. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And that's what most of our troubles in this country come from. That's why Mike Brown was killed without no, you know, recourse to justice. You understand? And you know, that's you know, but that's one of the reasons why I don't like this cat. I don't I don't like Obama. Michelle either. No, no. Yeah, I mean, every president is almost definitely a murderer in one mm -hmm. way or another. Absolutely. Every president has to take on the role of, you know, as commander in chief, they have bodies on them by the time Absolutely. they leave office. Unless it's an, a time of total peace, which I have not known in my lifetime a, a time. I doubt it. Any America. I, I doubt any time that America been standing that we had any period of peace like this. Yeah. Honestly. Yeah. Real talk. That's yeah. how we're going to end it. BG knockout. You know, appreciate you coming through. Appreciate you having me. And, uh, you know, we'll start having you on a more regular basis now. I appreciate it, man. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Bro. I mean, it's well earned. You know, always does huge numbers. People fuck with you. For sure. Appreciate you know, it. you still still look like you're 18. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it, man. I'm trying to stay. You know. Trying to stay young and no handsome. Doubt. You know what I'm oh, yeah. You know, tell your brother Dre so what's up for me. Yeah, for and, sure. I will. Uh, you know, keep doing your thing, man. For sure. Salute to you, Vlad. Appreciate you. Peace.